What thing is secretly just one giant scam? Gabu87 said. You know what actually got my blood boiling? My office has one of those multicolor ink printers but oddly, it was like black, green, pink and yellow. It ran out of yellow ink but the printer program straight up doesn't let me print black and white until I replace the yellow cartridge. This should be criminal. Scarfio said. I had a printer once with an emergency print mode. Best thing ever. If you were out of a color, put it in emergency mode and it would do the best it could with what was left. Photos would look pretty weird, but if you just needed to turn in a paper the next day and didn't care if the text was purple, it was great. This was probably 20 years ago and I haven't seen a printer with this feature since. The worst are the ones with a black cartridge and then a single tricolor cartridge. Then you have to replace all of the colors when one runs out. You can never use all of the ink because they don't run out at the same rate. Adorable Tumbleweed60 said. I'm expecting a girl in December. I took almost everything my cousin wanted to give me that she had left from her boys. My aunt and grandma said I can't put a girl in blue, orange, green, brown, etc. And I'm like this shit is expensive new, and chances are she's either going to shit or puke on them at some point. So what do I care if it's blue? It's like God forbid my daughter sleep in a sleeper with dinosaurs on it. Dad joke bad joke said. My wife made bank buying and reselling used baby clothes. She got familiar with all the hot brands on eBay at the time and when she was looking for clothes at the thrift store consignment shops for our kids she'd buy a bunch of other stuff to resell. A hat for a two year old's outfit, she sold for $70. Just the hat, not the matching dress and jacket. The brands would change the materials and patterns they used each year and some moms were obsessed with getting the whole outfit. I still remember a lady walking by when my daughter and I were out somewhere and she said nice Hannah. She didn't say your daughter looks cute in that dress, she had to drop the brand name to show she was up on fashion. Little 2000 said. I wonder if it's some sort of deal with the cable company that by buying in bulk they get a better rate. Though it doesn't matter much as you're getting the $150 mo plan for $100 mo if you never wanted it in the first place. And to that end, the apartment complex is likely getting a kickback somewhere in there. They are not doing it out of kindness to their tenants. I suppose there is some crazy timeline where they signed up for like a 40 year contract thinking cable was the real deal forever. Proud Hedgehog 6767 said. I used to live in a starlight building. On top of all the random add-ons, they were also in our unit on a nearly weekly basis for reasons that never made sense. Monthly smoke alarm checks, only annual are required, random inspections and walkthroughs with investors. Plus our air conditioning never worked correctly so we had to have somebody in at least once a month in the summer to try to fix it, and they only ever kind of cobbled things together. But rent-wise they weren't actually much more expensive than anything else in the city because everything is frankly outrageous. It was just a miserable few years as a tenant. MSF Ninja said. Casinos. All of the casinos in my state are video poker and video slot machines. There are barely any table games left. No one is happy, no one is having fun. It's just a room full of zombies feeding the machines and losing money. Every person I talk to is convinced that they know the secret formula to win. You cannot win. It might sound trivial but the old slots were just a spinning reel. These new machines are extremely addictive. The way the lights flash and the sounds go off like, bing bing bing. Winner of 40 cents. The entire thing is a psychology hack to give people the impression that they're winning when they're not. Akua said. The entire thing is a psychology hack to give people the impression that they're winning when they're not. There's a really interesting episode of the This American Life podcast about this. The new machines are regulated in the sense that the odds have to be legit, so for example, the machine might have to have a 1, 1000 chance of hitting some particular jackpot. However, there is no regulation with respect to what the spins reels look like on those other 999 attempts. So they are programmed to constantly show these near misses, giving the false impression that you kept coming so close to winning. They did a study of folks with gambling addictions, and the reward neuro trigger in the brain for these near misses was nearly the same as with legit wins. You know Inanoid said. Reward neuro trigger in the brain for these near misses was nearly the same as with legit wins. So true. Reminds me of a speech Al Pacino's character does in 2 for the money. See, most gamblers, when they go to gamble, they go to win. When we go to gamble, we go to lose. Subconsciously. Me, 
I never feel better than when they're raking the chips away, not bringing them in. And everyone here knows what I'm talking about. Hell, even when we win it's just a matter of time before we give it all back. Real Canadian Pouting said. When I was about 9 my grandparents took us to Vegas. We did things like Circus Circus, Treasure Island and saw some shows. One night as we were heading to a show there was a woman in the lobby, with a young daughter, 3ish, and she was sobbing and yelling at her husband. How could you? All of it? That was her daughter's money? I trusted you? I can't believe you gambled it all away. The little girl was hysterical and clutching a teddy bear. That scene has been imparted in my memory and I have zero desire to ever set foot in a casino. It's been nearly 30 years. The look the mother's face as she wailed is forever etched into my psyche. Plenty Object 1853 said. Heart, I've got one, not as touching as hers but still. My GF in 1996, who became my wife of 23 years, and I went to Trump Taj Mahal in AC and we parked on one of the higher floors in the garage and waited for the elevator. We were in good spirits, two twenty-somethings just having fun drinking and having tons of sex and now, trying our luck in AC. When the elevator doors opened, a couple, had to be in their 70s, exited. The woman looked, like the man had just smacked her. Like, no obvious bruises or swollen eye, but it was kinda obvious that something bad just went down. She was just looking at the floor as he let her off the elevator angrily by the elbow and he was ranting, You're bad luck, Helen. And you always been bad luck. Now think about it, the chance that these two senior citizens just met recently is slim. I think more so what we witnessed was a dysfunctional couple that had been together for years and this was part of the pathology if you will of their marriage. Anyways, soon after my GF became pregnant and we went on to have two kids and a pretty good marriage. But we always remember the couple exiting the elevator and we have rarely visited a casino since. Fool idiot is true said. My mother's best friend's entire family is into gambling. Her husband was dying of cancer, plus badly managed diabetes, and she dropped him off at penny slots regularly. I can't blame a dying man doing whatever makes him happy. But it was the saddest thing I've ever seen. And their daughter is a full-on addict. She has a good job as the head of the IT department of a company and it just disappears into the ether. I'll never blame an addict since I know what it feels like. But shit casinos are a plague. I'd advocate for them to be illegal if it weren't for the fact that they'd just go underground. Cream Brew Dogs said. Someone who grew up with worked in the casino industry, the psychological tricks go beyond the machines. There will be no clocks or natural light visible on the casino floor so the player loses all concept of time. The carpet has a pattern that will make you feel unpleasant and nauseous so you have to look at all the pretty lights and noises, and the layout of the machines and tables are intentionally as maze-like as possible. And as you might guess, you get free drinks to lower your inhibition. The casino's goal is always to take as much of your money as, legally, possible when you walk in. Gambling addiction is no joke, and in my opinion the machine addicts are the worst. The number of players I've seen wear diapers, or just downright piss shit their pants is mind-boggling. That being said, if played correctly, both video poker and blackjack give you a slight advantage over the house. But getting a whole table to play blackjack correctly is like herding cats. Drunk, coked up cats. Thor in high school said. To be fair, there are ones that work, but they are mostly just stimulants that suppress appetite. It's not the same as burning fat necessarily, but I mean, crystal meth will make you lose weight. There's some indication that caffeine will too, but the effect size is tiny. But that's not what you're talking about. What's dangerous about a lot of commercial fat burning products is that they are very often just a mixture of diuretics and caffeine, itself a diuretic as well as a stimulant. The weight loss is essentially temporary, because it's literal water weight, and the dehydration that ensues can be potentially lethal. Older than my prince said. I'd old enough to remember actual pyramid schemes, which were legal for a while in the late 70s and into the 80s. I had a co-worker explaining that the way you do it is you wait until you're close to getting the payout, then you get your friends to join the scheme, to get you to the top. In other words, the way for you to win was to set things up so that your friends would be sure to lose. Later, 88 or so, my housemates had a pyramid program meeting at the house, where they were very careful to talk about power units and not dollars and you were not supposed to exchange power units at the meeting. That was supposed to make it legal. Looking back, 
It's hard to believe that people really bought into this shit, but it happened. Alf Alfarigan said. We can blame the plastic lobby for that. They are allowed to put a recyclable symbol on anything. Whether it is recyclable or not. Materials which are not recyclable slows down the process and damages equipment. Single-use plastics are the literal worst. In case people don't already know how plastic is made, its main ingredient is a derivative of fossil fuels like natural gas. Greek Nord said. I got tricked into a few of those meetings when I was younger. They can be clever in how they get people in too. They make job postings that describe it very well like a regular job, sometimes not even mentioning sales, they market it as customer service. They set up an interview with you, and you don't know until you actually get there that 50 other people got the interview too and you're all interviewing together, watching a presentation. City I used to live had an Herbalife bar. They'd make job postings and make you think you were applying to actually work at the bar where they sold drinks and smoothies and stuff. It was just a ploy to get you to the Herbalife MLM meeting with them, conveniently hosted in the bar where you could also buy their drinks since the meeting was over an hour. Shy Squid had said. I work at a place that sells lottery every single day to people. Some people will buy scratch tickets, Powerball, etc. They come back to the counter 5-23 times the same day trading their tickets for more, spending more money because they lost all of the previous winning or just be in an endless loop of never winning any more and not losing any less. I've asked why they do it, and they say because if they don't hit big it's not worth the cash. So winning one minus one hundred dollars is nothing to them. But they don't realize even if they do win big they practically are just getting only half back of what they spent trying so hard to get. It's a lose-lose, lottery is indeed a huge ass scam. Guy from Death Valley said. I always had this kind of thought that, dude, we should live our life 1 slash 3 rd of our life consists of working a job, or studying for a job another 1 slash 3 rd is sleeping, and the last 1 slash 3 rd is free time, of which you then also need to spend with other stuff you don't want. And then, at 64 years you are finally allowed to live your life without working your ass off anymore. But you also, statistically, have less than 20 years left to live, and might already be too broken and sick, maybe due to your work as well to do anything but sit at home. I don't mind the constant dread of someday I die, but knowing that I spend my days like this and might die before I can enjoy the rest of my life, that kinda gives me goosebumps at times. I know this is currently how civilization works but like. I still find it kinda questionable. Three Legged Spitter said. Yeah, Reddit never talks about this side of it. I absolutely enjoy the idea of my time in the trades, I still build things for myself and friends. But I knew I would have a broken down body and I'd still have to find something else before I hit 40 slash 50. My dad could barely use his hands, legs and back were shot and he's way tougher than me. There is a trade off for doing this kind of work. Automatic Llama said. Word? The main reason I didn't go into a trade was my tradesman uncles telling me to go to college, usually after describing some awful and totally commonplace injury they had sustained on the job. Whenever I get bummed about my office job, I remember my uncle showing my this gnarly scar he got when a live wire was somehow whipped into the flesh of his forearm. Don't have to deal with that shit sitting at a desk. Madam Nerd said. I've been in higher education since 2007. Got a BA, an MA, and now work with an administration at a public university. But my brother went the trade route and is now a diesel mechanic. And we both love our respective choices. I will say though that if even if you don't want or need a traditional four-year degree, some college classes are worth taking just to expand your thinking a bit. Obviously cost still plays a role in that, but I've known people who have had good luck taking such classes at community colleges. Flying Kiwi 74 said. Unless you become self-employed the majority of tradespeople don't earn much long-term in comparison to office jobs that people with uni degrees get. Plus there are the inevitable injuries and dangers of working around other trades random idiots on site, time off work due to weather and material shortages, and having to pay all kinds of insurances and maybe advertising. Balancing it isn't easy, self-employed tradies earn just 40 to 45 hours weeks work and you can enjoy your time off, getting started you have to go out and do unpaid quotes, do your pricing and so much paperwork etc, most fail within 2 years and go back to working for someone else. Captain Plummet said. The fucking wedding industry in the US. 
$20,000, $30,000 for a single day, stressful as hell event. When I learned a photographer alone runs $5,000 minimum I almost puked. And a lot of venues didn't give a shit about COVID and hosted packed weddings, resulting in deaths because we gotta make money somehow absolute slime balls. Now before all the vendors dogpile me, let me be clear, I'm fully aware why you guys charge as much as you do. I also hope you understand why an average person like me looks at the price and says hell no. And for those that want a conventional wedding, if you can swing it, do whatever you want. My wife and I did a sandals all-inclusive vodka wedding honeymoon, which has its own pros and cons but still a no-brainer due to the cost and convenience. MKC816 said he've been married for 11 years. WW were going to go to City Hall, but my grandma really wanted us to get married in her church. We rented the church hall for $100 for the day, made a donation of $100 to the church and gave the pastor a $50 gift card to the local bookstore. Total cost was maybe $500 bucks for everything and there were very few details to plan or keep track of. We told everyone to dress casual, my mom made simple lunch style food and my friend took some photos with our camera. It was great, everyone had fun, and we have really sweet memories from that day. My sister had a $25k plus wedding. It was a nightmare of stress, not only for her, but for Evron involved. It's been a few years, but she still says they she regrets not keeping it simple. Driving and flying said. Paying for college in the United States. The thing I hate about the current educational system in the United States is that it is designed to put a student in debt. As of 2020 to 2021, the average a student can expect to pay for one year's in-state tuition and fees is $25,864 at a four-year state university, and out-of-state tuition is $43,721. As of 2021, the maximum amount of federal Pell Grant money a student can get per year is only $6,495. That leaves the in-state student with $19,369 they have to cover somehow, and that almost always means borrowing the money. As a result, it's common to see a student graduate college with a bachelor's degree, and well over $50,000 minus $60,000 in debt that they'll have to start paying off about six months after they get out of college. The government knows this, and the lending institutions know this. Students are getting screwed by this system. Dynasty 2201 said, With companies waking up to the flexibility of WFH, Having been forced to do it the last 1.5 years or so, I'd wager there's potential for the five-day work week to slowly die out too. Major companies like Microsoft have shown a notable increase in work production, happiness and attitude of staff by switching to four-day weeks in a trial period. This notion of 9-5, five days a week is, like most attitudes concerning work in the Western world anyway, Completely outdated and no longer needed but fat old boomers are still in charge with that mindset they were brought up on. Get up Steve Dave said. They have won some lawsuits. If you read articles, written by journalists who have access to LexisNexis and can look up court cases by defendants and their outcomes, between 1990 to 2011, they have been awarded dollar sign 250,000. A 2011 case in which the court ruled in favor of WBC for exercising their right to free speech during the funeral of a Marine. The Marine's family eventually paid WBC $16,500 at $10. In the 1990s, WBC sued the city of Topeka several times for not providing the group protection during protests. They won $43,000 in legal fees. WBC in 1995 won more than $100,000 from a lawsuit against the Kansas Funeral Picketing Act because it was a violation of the First Amendment. A federal judge found the law unconstitutional and the city of Bellevue paid Phelps Roper $17,000 in 2007. They state their own expenses per year for travel to protests is $200 minus $300,000 a year. Most of their money comes from within, from those that have government jobs in a law firm they run in Kansas. Locals have said of their law firm. People in town said, well, we don't like them, but if we want to win a case, we'll go to them. Super awesome Brian said. Ah yes, the thing where the people determining your trustworthiness will look at your credit usage and say, ooh ah ah, you use too much of your monthly credit allowance. You seem too reliant on credit, we gotta dock your score for that. So you cut back on how much you charge and they say, ooh ah ah. You aren't using enough of your monthly credit allowance. 
You weren't a valuable customer to them too. We gotta dock your score for that. Another thing I just love about credit score is how I will change literally nothing in my life for an 8 month stretch. Yet my credit score will fluctuate plus 50 points month to month. No missed bills. No change in credit utilization. No new lines of credit. No new debts. But they see something month to month that wildly changes your credit worthiness. Absolute scam. Slicky said. Cryptocurrencies 99% of them are technically just a copy fork of others, with usually no real value added. Most coins white papers told us back in 2017-18 how their rollout will happen, how their currency will be accepted in most online shops, retail stores etc, but that never happened. Most code bases are more or less abandoned, the developers don't even react on critical bugs. The imprint has no email, no telephone, no legal address. The transaction fees are absurdly high, often even higher than the purchase itself, making it completely useless for retail. Tanks and the Funkabin said. Credit scores. The US is one of the only countries that uses this system and it's nothing more than a thinly veiled way of preventing class mobility and keeping people in debt. Don't have enough credit cards? Score goes down. Have too many? Score goes down. Use your cards too much? Score drops. Don't you use enough? Score drops. Have too much debt? Score drops. Don't have enough debt? Drop. Pay off debt? Score drops. Check your score too much? Another ding. It's what tells banks you can't afford a $900 monthly mortgage so enjoy your $1,400 monthly rent. Have a good paying job and 3x rent in your bank account but a score under 700? Good luck renting. Sean Air said. Home Advisor and Angie's List. Please stop using them. Each time you search for a contractor you generate a lead that then goes to a contractor on the network who gets charged a hefty sum for your lead, even if you aren't really serious at all about the project you are looking up. The contractors have to pay for that lead regardless if you talk to them or not. The prices of these leads range between $50 and $300. Here's where it gets real fucky. Both of those companies are owned by the same parent company, IAC and leads generated on Angie's list are turned around and sold to multiple other contractors on Home Advisor who also get charged for them even if the jobs for that lead has already been completed. Every single thing about these services is a titanic scam and I cannot fathom how these organizations are allowed to exist. The Bees 21 said. Health insurance in the US and how things are priced in the healthcare system. Funeral homes. Not funerals themselves like they are a healthy part of the grieving process. But these places are just scamming people with insane costs while they are in vulnerable mental states. The US political system. Voting. The people we elect don't represent the common man who put them in office. They represent whoever bribes them the most through donations. The fact that companies are people by law and can donate to politicians is the biggest scam in us history. Cable. The housing market. Being able to buy and own land is the biggest scam in human history. It's fucking science said. Probably gonna get a load of abuse but I can't help feeling like cryptocurrency is the world's biggest scam, possibly ever in all history. Millions of people have been convinced that they should trade collective billions of fiat currency for internet tokens with no intrinsic value, that don't do anything, in a way of getting rich quick. They'll say they like the tech, or it will be revolutionary and doom the current financial system by giving power to the masses. All cult BS. Crypto doesn't solve any problems that people have. It's been around for over a decade and there is no mass adoption. It's not useful at all. People just like it because their number goes up, but when the music stops and people run for the exits they will get burned. It's a less than zero sum game. Money only goes into the crypto ecosystem via people paying their money for crypto. Money leaves via mining costs, exchange fees, etc. How is everyone here going to get rich? There's not any real or tangible value here. It's a real emperor has no clothes moment. Who knows how long it will carry on for.